and Linda and the Council on Aging and of course Gleason Library for allowing me to speak to the community. I have been a Carlisle resident for almost 15 years and the Council on Aging is near and dear to my heart. Many of you know my parents, Shoba and Ananda Kerker. They've been members of the Council on Aging for many, many years. And each of my three sons has performed uh, musical concerts for many of your luncheons over the past several years. So it's, it's really a true pleasure to be here. I hope um, in the next 30 minutes or so, um, I will be able to give you some information that you will find useful and uh, insightful. I've learned a lot of lessons over the years caring for patients um, with GI conditions over the last 20 years or so. And I'd like to share some of those stories with you, some of those experiences, hopefully tease out truth from urban myths and, um, and, uh, and uh, answer your questions at the end of this talk. Jen, I just see someone drawing on my screen. I don't know how that's happening, but <laughs> that's why I pause for a minute. Um, so do you have any idea why someone's drawing on my screen? <laughs> okay, well, we'll keep going. Hopefully they'll stop drawing. So go right over here, sorry. <clears throat> So one of the most common conditions that I talk to patients about is heartburn or acid reflux. And one of the things I do when I talk to a patient about their symptoms is I tell them, what are your symptoms? Describe them to me. Because many patients say to me, I have acid reflux. Well, acid reflux is a diagnosis. It's a condition. And a lot of patients actually don't have acid reflux. They have other symptoms that they attribute or feel is the condition or disease acid reflux. So let me take a moment and tell you what the disease is. We'll go over what the actual common symptoms are and what the atypical symptoms are of acid reflux. How do you treat it? For how long? And what can you do on a personal note to minimize these symptoms? So acid reflux is a condition where gastric contents, which contain not only acid, but also bile and other gastric secretions, they go from the stomach up into the esophagus. And usually that occurs because there's a sphincter muscle called the lower esophageal sphincter muscle, which connects the esophagus to the stomach. That sphincter muscle typically works normally, but it inappropriately relaxes. And when it inappropriately relaxes, those stomach contents come up into the esophagus. Um, so the symptoms that are classic of acid reflux are usually burning in the chest, or people will describe sort of their chest is on fire. Um, sometimes patients will have regurgitation, which is liquid, sheer liquid sort of coming up to the top of their throat. And you might experience that if you're bending down, for example, and tying your shoelace, you might get a wave of liquid coming up. And then other patients have a salty, brackishy uh, taste in their mouth or bile in their mouth, what we call water brash. So that's the sort of textbook symptoms associated with acid reflux. But they're also atypical symptoms of acid reflux. I have a patient I recall um, some time ago whose two brothers and father died of a heart attack before the age of 60. And his only symptom of acid reflux was chest pain. So you can imagine I got chest pain every time I spoke with him because he didn't have any of the classic symptoms. He just had chest pain and that was his manifestation of acid reflux. Other atypical symptoms include voice changes. So I have some singers who come to see me and um, they basically uh, you know, came because they couldn't reach those high notes and that's what we call LPR. And so that can be a manifestation of acid reflux. Sometimes people have a chronic cough as a symptom of acid reflux. And sometimes a dentist will send a patient to me because they will have um, enamel breakdown from acid reflux. So those are the sort of atypical manifestations of acid reflux. So not everyone has the textbook symptoms of burning, regurgitation, and water brush. So that's something to keep in mind. Burping is not acid reflux. So I have a lot of patients who say, oh, I have acid reflux. And then I ask them what their symptoms are and they'll tell me, oh, well, I'm belching and burping all the time. Well, we'll get to that. That is not acid reflux. 
Um, so how do you treat acid reflux? Well, it depends on the severity and the frequency of your symptoms. If you have symptoms less than three times per week, you probably don't need to be on a daily medication. And so for those patients, I recommend H2 blockers. And H2 blockers are the most common and old ones, Tagamet, Zantac, which is now off the market, as you know. Um, and so I recommend Pepsid or Famotidine. You can buy it over the counter and a doctor can prescribe it for you in a 20 or 40 milligram dose. Now, again, that's for people who have acid reflux maybe once or twice a week or once or twice a month. And, you know, the precipitance of acid reflux, we didn't go over that. Um, there are certain foods that are precipitants of acid reflux, the most common being caffeine, chocolate, alcohol, for those smokers, nicotine, um, and um, peppermint. People don't think of mint as, uh, as an etiology precipitating acid reflux. So those are the kinds of foods, if you're prone to acid reflux, you can minimize and hopefully, you know, you can make those dietary changes to minimize your symptoms. Now, what if you happen to have symptoms that occur more frequently? You're having daily acid reflux or at least three times per week. Well, then you need to be on a medication. And the most commonly prescribed medication for acid reflux are proton pump inhibitors, of which Prilosec, which is the trade name, or omeprazole, which is the generic name, is most common. And that is a 20 milligram dose that one should take first thing in the morning with a glass of water, not coffee or tea, and then wait a minimum of 30 minutes before you eat food. And ideally the food should be protein, fat, and carbohydrates. I have a lot of patients who are runners who don't like to have breakfast. So I recommend a small peanut butter cracker, which has the perfect content to stimulate PPI, um, to stimulate basically acid so that when you have the PPI on board, you've got the acid uh, released and then the medicine will block those acid potassium pumps. So that is for people who have acid reflux frequently. Now, patients will often say to me, I read the product label, it says I should only be taking Prilosec for 14 days. So they typically take it for 14 days, they stop taking it and their symptoms recur. So when I give talks on this to primary care doctors, I say it's gastroesophageal reflux disease. The D is the disease. So in some patients, it's a chronic disease. And the 14 day labeling is very, very confusing because Prilosec was approved in the 1980s where the FDA gave a two week labeling. But I've had patients who've been on Prilosec for over 20 years. So if you have frequent acid reflux symptoms and you're talking to your physician or your GI specialist, you may need to take a medicine like Prilosec daily, an hour before breakfast for many, many years. Now, the other question that always pops up, especially when in JAMA, the dementia study came out is, how safe is this medication? I've read all these different things about it. Does it cause dementia? Does it cause bone loss? Does it cause kidney problems? And does it cause infections? And I can say that, you know, the dementia study was published in a very, very good journal. The osteoporosis study also was published in a good journal, but this is, it's out of the scope of this talk, but I will say that many, many statisticians and epidemiologists have reviewed these articles. And there are a lot of confounders, there are a lot of other reasons why people ended up with either dementia or osteoporosis. And the GI community, the, the, the president of the AGA and the other GI societies, we feel that these medications are safe and in the appropriate setting, you know, should be used chronically. But again, you may need to have an individualized um, conversation. But again, the dementia, the paper that there was, it was filled with a lot of uh, different issues. So people should not be worried about taking this medicine and having it called dem cause dementia or osteoporosis. But again, feel free to discuss that with your own physician. So we talked about acid reflux. What's another common condition that I see? An ulcer. So let's talk about that for a second. What is an ulcer? So ulcers are caused when there's a breakdown in the gastric mucosa, and that can occur for a variety of different reasons. The most common reason why people get ulcers in the United States is because of NSAIDs or anti-inflammatories, aspirin being one of them. 
And one of the things that I like to say is there's nothing baby about baby aspirin. It is highly effective for coronary artery disease and preventing heart attacks, and it is highly effective at causing ulcers. You know, they talk about coated aspirin and baby aspirin, and uh, you know, if you take it on a full stomach and it's a buffered aspirin, this is, these are all marketing gimmicks. So you, any of those things can cause an ulcer. Taking it on a full stomach, you can still get an ulcer. Your risk of ulcer disease over age 60 goes up 13 fold. In fact, recently um, the um, guidelines are shifting away from people just taking a baby aspirin just because, because so many individuals, especially individuals over the age of 60, end up with complications such as GI bleeding and they end up in the hospital. So it's now recommended that aspirin only be taken in people with known coronary artery disease or high risk factors for CAD, or you know, like they have diabetes or they have a stroke or other reasons why they need to be on aspirin or they have a stent, for example. But just taking an aspirin because you live in the United States and you're over age 55, that is not recommended anymore. So ulcers can be painless. People don't realize that. A lot of people think that an ulcer is associated with abdominal pain. Yes, sure enough, ulcers can cause abdominal pain, can ca cause classically a gnawing sensation in the epigastric area, uh, early satiety or fullness. But oftentimes there's no symptoms whatsoever and patients with an ulcer will just present with bleeding. And the bleeding can be black stools. So I always inform my patients, if you have black stools and it looks like ink or tar, that is bleeding from the upper GI system. Usually what happens is the blood in the stomach, the um, acid oxidizes the iron and you will have black stools. So if you ever start passing black stools, that is a very concerning symptom and it probably means you're bleeding internally and usually from the upper GI tract. Now, if the bleeding or the ulcer where you can see in the picture, you're getting uh, basically like a crater, you're exposing a blood vessel and that blood vessel can spurt and then people actually pass red blood when they go to the bathroom or they'll start vomiting blood. So those are the symptoms of GI bleeding associated with ulcers. And then of course, if you have low level bleeding, you can become anemic and the symptoms of anemia or low blood flow can be fatigue, can be shortness of breath um, and you know, just sort of just being tired um, or fatigued. So those are, cons those are symptoms that you should watch for as well. Um, what else causes ulcers? We talked about aspirin and NSAIDs. So NSAIDs are your Motrin, Advil, um, Naproxen, um, Meloxicam. All of these agents can cause ulcers. Um, Celebrex is a COX-2 selective uh, blocker. So it causes ulcers at a much lower rate than your typical Motrin or Meloxicam. But the other big risk factor for ulcers is a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori comes in different strains. You know, in the clinical practice, we don't subtype those strains, but Helicobacter pylori can definitely cause ulcers. And so if somebody is in the hospital and they have an ulcer and they've been hospitalized, we usually do a stool sample to check for Helicobacter pylori. And if they're positive for Helicobacter pylori, we like to eradicate the bacteria by giving them a course of antibiotics for two weeks to minimize their risk of recurrent ulcers. I don't like to treat Helicobacter pylori just because someone has abdominal pain because you're putting someone on two weeks of antibiotics that has its own consequences. And the risk benefit trade-off is, you know, you have to treat a lot of patients before someone feels better just with abdominal pain because they have H. pylori. But it is really important to treat someone who's had a complication like an ulcer or bleeding if they have H. pylori because you don't want them to have this as a recurrent problem. Now, my patients always say to me, hey, doc, you know, I'm totally stressed, so I think I have an ulcer. Urban myth. You do not get an ulcer from stress. Not stress the way we have stress in our daily lives. You can get an ulcer from physiologic stress. And, you know, and what I mean by physiologic stress are people in burn units people in the intensive care unit. You know, their bodies are undergoing significant physiologic stress. So in that setting, yes, those people are at risk for ulcers. So I hope you understand a little bit now about gastroesophageal reflux disease, dietary changes that you can implement to minimize 
those symptoms, what medications are available to you, how safe they are, what is ulcer disease, what causes it, and how you can treat ulcer disease, which I didn't say. Prilosec, again, 20 milligrams twice a day for 12 weeks can heal an ulcer completely. And depending on your risk factors, your doctor may or may not recommend that you stay on Prilosec indefinitely so that you don't get an ulcer in the future. So what else do I talk to my patients about? Well, the number one thing that I'm seeing over the last five years is symptoms of bloating. Um, bloating is one of those symptoms that is very frustrating and embarrassing to patients because not only do they feel uncomfortable because they feel bloated or distended, but they also are burping a lot. Remember I talked to you about acid reflux where people are belching or burping and they attribute that to reflux, but really it's gas in the GI tract that's causing them to belch or burp, or they pass a lot of flatus and that can be very inopportune and embarrassing. So what are the causes of bloating? What do we think about when patients tell me, you know what doc, I'm having a lot of symptoms of bloating. Well, the number one thing and the most common thing I see is lactose intolerance. And that occurs with age. So there are some kids that are lactose intolerant, and that's different from the food, the milk protein allergy that young babies and infants get. They're, the lactose intolerance that young adults can get is they're actually losing their lactase enzyme, and so they don't make enough enzyme, and then they don't, they can't absorb the lactose uh, milk sugar that's in a lot of our foods. With every decade, you lose that enzyme. So about 50% of 50 year olds are lactose intolerant. And with every decade that goes up, more and more people are lactose intolerant. Um, in Scientific American, there was a very interesting article about a small community in Scandinavia where 80 and 90 year olds still were not lactose intolerant. But of course, you know, they were in an agricultural society where they were making their own um, cheese and you know, other dairy products. And that subgroup maintain the gene to continue to make lactase. But in general, most adults over age 60 are lactose intolerant. So I will be informing my patients about that. There's a lot of hidden foods with lactose that people don't realize. A lot of my patients say to me, doc, I don't have any milk and I really don't have cheese. But they don't realize that lactose is in bread, it's in biscuits, it's in bagels, it's in croissants, it, you know, a lot of, it's in cereal even if you don't add milk. So these are the kinds of things you wanna think about if you start experiencing symptoms of bloating. Another common condition, I'd say common because it is relatively common. I think there's a lot of recognition in the uh, medical community. Um, I used to have a list when I first started practice almost 20 years ago of my celiac patients. I could have a very long spreadsheet now. I have so many patients that I manage and take care of with celiac disease. And I think part of it is I recognize that I do the testing for it. I think just in general, there's a lot of awareness, public awareness of, of what is celiac disease. I'm gonna go get back and talk about celiac disease in more detail, but that's another cause of bloating. Um, foods and drinks. So many of our foods contain fructose and other fermentable um, oligo and disaccharides, and these sugars are difficult for our bodies to process. Carbonated beverages can contribute to bloating. Chewing gum can contribute to bloating because you have aerophasia. If you have obstructive sleep apnea, you may be bloated because of the way you're breathing when you're sleeping at night. So these are things that you should also think about if you're experiencing symptoms of bloating. Now, another entity that sort of popped up fairly recently is this entity of uh, bacterial imbalance in the microbiome or bacterial overgrowth. So let me just take a minute and tell you what that is. So our microbiomes are basically um, a, an unknown frontier. There's a lot of researchers doing a lot of work on the microbiome, trying to understand why shifts in the microbiome may lead to obesity why shifts in the microbiome may put us at risk for cancer. So there's a lot that we don't know about the microbiome and there's a lot of active research. Now, I think in the next 20 years, we're gonna have a lot more information um, and individual footprints on microbiomes to help us understand the role that the microbiome plays in disease, um, disease um, progression, essentially, diagnosis and progression. Um, but there are patients who have had abdominal surgery, gastric bypass surgery is on the rise in the US because we have a obese population. And these patients have 
parts of the GI tract connected in ways that nature had not intended. And so they're at risk for bacterial overgrowth. Um, there are also, also other autoimmune conditions such as scleroderma, um, where you have abnormal motility in the GI tract, and that also leads people to bacterial overgrowth. So if you've had surgeries or if you, if you have autoimmune conditions and you're experiencing bloating, then it's worthwhile to see a GI specialist and see if you may be at risk for bacterial overgrowth. And the last thing I'll just say is there's a lot of overuse of probiotics. I have patients spending a ton of money on probiotics. And I think you have to be an educated consumer when you go and shop for probiotics. Their probiotics are not medicines. They're just labeled as nutritional supplements. So there's very little data guiding their efficacy. And so you, there's a lot of very expensive products that are out there with very little data. So I would just urge you to be an educated consumer you know, ask your physician, you know what, I'm thinking about getting this probiotic. You know, is it a journal you've ever heard of? Or can you even Google it? Does anyone even read the journal? How big is the study? You know, ask those type of questions before, you know, I have patients who spend hundreds of dollars per month for probiotics where there's no data that they work at all. When do I as a GI specialist use probiotics? Actually, I use them in very specific situations. I use them in patients who have been on antibiotics for various reasons and their risk for antibiotic associated diarrhea or they've had C. diff colitis, for example. We're gonna talk about that later as well. Um, or I use them in certain situations where you know, people have suffered from a bacterial viral illness because they've traveled abroad and come back to the United States. So I think that you have to use probiotics judiciously. Um, you really don't have to be on, pro pro you don't have to be on probiotics daily. It's not like taking a vitamin every day. So. Um, I wanted to dispel that myth as well. So let's move on to from bloating to change in bowel habits. So diarrhea. The one thing that I always ask patients when they tell me I'm having diarrhea is tell me what you mean by diarrhea. I know that sounds like a funny question, but it's really important to understand what a patient is feeling, experiencing, so you can be on the same page with them and you can understand what are they describing. You know, are they, some patients will basically just have a soft stool and they'll think that's diarrhea. Diarrhea is really having a watery stool, you know, urgency with a watery stool or frequent watery stools or urgent stools. That's the definition of diarrhea. So when I speak to a patient, they're having diarrhea, I really want to find out, is this kind of a new problem or has this been going on for a while? Because what you think about as the cause depends on whether or not the problem is new or more chronic. Um, I then carefully review their medications. There are so many, so many medications uh, where the side effect of the medication is um, diarrhea. So common examples are some diabetic medicines that cause diarrhea, such as metformin. That's my big plague. I've had to take patients off of metformin, consulting with their doctor and their endocrinologist because it causes terrible, terrible diarrhea in a subgroup of patients. Uh, some patients are on SSRIs or antidepressants where the side effect is diarrhea, um, to name a few. So I think you have to be really careful about the medications that you're on um, and see if it causes diarrhea. Obviously, if you have cancer and you're undergoing treatment for cancer, a lot of those new medications cause diarrhea as well. Um, the other thing I always look at is there are endocrine issues that cause diarrhea. I once diagnosed a patient with Graves disease. Um, and her symptom was diarrhea. She didn't really have any of the other sort of classic symptoms of hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease. So you always want to, you know, that's one of the reasons why I went into GI is because you really have to think about the entire body uh, because so many other organ systems impact the GI tract. And you really have to have that holistic approach when you see the patient. So you're also thinking about other organ systems that may impact and affect the GI tract and cause symptoms. And then lastly, there are autoimmune diseases, which I'm going to go to in more detail, that can cause diarrhea. The opposite of diarrhea is constipation. So what is constipation? Well, the textbook definition of constipation is not having a bowel movement for up to five to seven days. Now, I have a lot of patients who say to me, Doc, I'm constipated. And then I say, well, when was your last bowel movement? And they'll say, this morning. Okay, so why would they say that? Well, because a lot of times patients are going every single day 
but they're having a difficult time going to the bathroom. Um, it's hard, or they have what I like to call, or and what researchers call, an unsatisfactory bowel movement. And so they, they pass these little pellets, and they just don't feel like they've had a good bowel movement, and they attribute that to being constipated. So I think it's really important when patients say, you know, I'm constipated, or where you think you're constipated, to clarify what that means. Does that mean you know, you're not having a bowel movement for a few days, or are you having daily bowel movements? What are the quality of those bowel movements? Um, and what's important is, if somebody has gone to the bathroom every third or fourth day their entire life, well, that's not, they're not constipated. That is on the spectrum of normal. That's normal for them. So the, the context is, matters. If somebody always goes to the bathroom every three to four days, and now all of a sudden they're not going to the bathroom for seven days, well, that's important. Or if you have someone who, you know, patient says, I go to the bathroom every morning like clockwork, and there's a change in that, where they're now having difficulty going to the bathroom, and they haven't had a bowel movement for three or four days. That's, that can be concerning. Why is that happening? So what do I think of when it's new? Well, again, just like the diarrhea piece, medications. I had a patient of mine who had complex cardiac issues, and she was followed at the Brigham. She was on a high-dose diltiazem. 360 milligrams and it was causing constipation. And I had to call her cardiologist and we had to work together to get on a different medication and it fixed her constipation problem. So you really have to look at medications. Hypothyroidism or an underactive thyroid can lead to constipation, abnormalities, electrolyte abnormalities like calcium, phosphorus can also lead to constipation. Sometimes people take excessive doses of vitamins which contribute to constipation. So all of these things come to play. Now, if you have an older patient who's not had a colonoscopy and or has new symptoms of constipation, then you of course worry about cancer or neoplasia of the colon. And in that situation, you know, your doctor or your GI specialist may recommend colonoscopy if there's been an abrupt change in your stool pattern. And of course, if you have symptoms of bleeding or weight loss, then those are what we call alarm symptoms. And those are symptoms that you worry about and you would want to proceed with colonoscopy for further evaluation. So we've reviewed diarrhea, constipation, change in bowel habits, some of the common reasons people have this problem if it's acute, some of the things that can occur when it's chronic. Um, and actually I wanna just pause for one second and talk about chronic idiopathic constipation, um, which is a condition. I have three generations of patients, a grandmother, her daughter, and then the granddaughter who's in college, where everybody goes to the bathroom every two to three weeks. And that is such a thing. It's a motility disorder that can affect family members in, and um, you know there's treatment for it. Um, surprisingly, they're not bloated, they're not uncomfortable. They've sort of accommodated to going to the bathroom every two to three weeks. So I have patients who go daily who think they're constipated, and then I have patients who go every three weeks who are constipated. And the good news is, it's um, you can treat both of those conditions well by correctly identifying and diagnosing what the problem is. So when I was talking to you about bloating and diarrhea, I mentioned that I was gonna talk about autoimmune diseases that can cause both of those symptoms. So one of the diseases that, you know, as I mentioned, we're all diagnosing more in, and there's a public awareness for this is celiac disease. So I want to take a minute and, and speak about celiac disease. And I have some endoscopic pictures on the screen here for you, which is this textbook and beautiful example of what celiac disease looks like. So celiac disease is associated with diabetes and also with Down syndrome. So there's a high prevalence of celiac disease in those two conditions, diabetes and Down syndrome. And so um, patients can present with a variety of symptoms. And celiac disease can be difficult to diagnose sometimes because the symptoms are kind of garden variety. For example, sometimes patients just have bloating and we just went over all the other causes of bloating. So you have to sort of think about this autoimmune disease and all the other things I went over that can cause a common symptom like bloating. Sometimes patients have diarrhea and so they'll basically be going to the bathroom. They'll have a change in their stool pattern and have frequent bowel movements. Sometimes they'll be malabsorbing. They won't be because celiac disease affects the small intestine, the duodenum, um, and you get this classic scalloping. You can see in the pictures, the second picture over, it almost looks like a potato chip where you get like the ridging, you know, on those 
these um, the lay potato, the ruffles potato chips. That's how I sort of think about it, and that's called scalloping of the duodenum. And um, when you have this kind of scalloping, you malabsorb the nutrients that you're ingesting, and that can cause weight loss and abdominal pain and bloating. And then you, I have patients I've diagnosed. My oldest patient I worked at the San Francisco VA. He was in his 80s, and he presented with iron deficiency anemia. And he had no other symptoms and he had celiac disease that I diagnosed him in his 80s. So whenever you see a patient with unexplained iron deficiency anemia, you always want to think about celiac disease. And the reason they're iron deficient is because iron absorption occurs in the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. And so that's also something to keep in mind. Now, in patients with celiac disease, it's an autoimmune disease. And so microscopic cross-contamination matters. So these patients have to be gluten-free to the nth degree. Um, they often have to have uh, their own utensils um, at home, their own toaster, their own pots and pans. They're not sharing with their family unless the whole family is gluten-free. That is very different from people who are gluten intolerant or gluten sensitive. In that situation, those people do not have an autoimmune disease. They may experience bloating and maybe some change in bowel habits when they ingest gluten. What I frequently find, it's not the gluten that causes them problems. It's usually all of those fermentable oligo and disaccharides I talked about that cause bloating. And when you buy a gluten-free product, because it has to adhere to the standards of being gluten-free, they've removed some of those other fermentable oligo and disaccharides from the food group. But it's very expensive. So you really want to see a specialist and figure out if you have celiac disease, because if you don't, being gluten-free is, is very challenging and you shouldn't have to embark and be gluten-free unless you know that you have this condition. There are some people, as I mentioned, who may have bloating and they do better with low, not necessarily gluten, but low fermentable oligo and disaccharides. Um, so that's also something that you want to keep in the back and uh, back of your mind. So I always like to tell patients and educate them celiac disease versus gluten sensitivity. And there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things out there about, you know, gluten-free products and improving symptoms of arthritis. The data there is not particularly strong. I have some of my own celiac patients who tell me that they spent $7 on gluten-free shampoo to which I respond, are you planning to eat the shampoo? And they look at me <laughs> and they're totally embarrassed. And I tell them, you don't, why are you spending that kind of money? I mean, you know, the marketing is, is you can market anything. There is gluten-free lipstick that Chanel makes a nice gluten-free lipstick. Now that makes sense because if you have celiac disease, you are licking your lips, right? But you do not need to buy gluten-free um, shampoo if you have celiac disease. It's a true question. So let's move on to some other autoimmune diseases. Um, this is my personal uh, favorite. Uh, I have a special expertise in this area. Um, I love taking care of my patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and within inflammatory bowel disease is the subgroup of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And these are autoimmune diseases, very common in the United States. Usually the onset is unfortunately young, young kids to young adults. Um, I'm not a pediatric gastroenterologist. I'm an adult gastroenterologist. So my youngest patients are 18, but I have many patients between 18 and 30 who I manage with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. But I wrote an article, actually a chapter with my, my, one of my mentors at Beth Israel, Dr. Mark Peppercorn on Crohn's disease in the elderly. So a lot of patients don't realize that they can get Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis after age 60. I had a patient who was having rectal bleeding, her PCP, rather than send her to me, she was my established patient, sent her to a surgeon who did an exam and found out that she had ulcerative colitis and said, you know what, do you have a GI doctor? You should go see your GI doctor. She came to see me and her grandson had Crohn's disease and she had ulcerative colitis at the age of 76. So it's something that if you have diarrhea, bleeding, weight loss, or a family history, of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and you're over age 60, you can certainly develop Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis for the first time. And older people also get something called ischemic colitis, which is low blood flow to the colon. And uh, those symptoms can also be bleeding and diarrhea. So again, 
there, there are many reasons why seniors can get symptoms of, of bleeding and diarrhea, but you know, a specialist should always think of that Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and ischemic colitis. Now, a lot of my female patients who I take care of who are over the age of 60 will have what I like to call nuisance diarrhea. Unlike my Crohn's and UC patients where they're very, very sick, often on steroids, often have to be in the hospital, although now we have such good medications for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, there's all these biologic therapies that they're on, these infusions, these commercials you see on TV, medicines like Humira, uh, Remicade, Intibio, Stellara. Um, those conditions you see in Crohn's can be quite severe. Um, the nuisance diarrhea is usually associated with an autoimmune disease, less severe called microscopic colitis. There's a female predominance and over age 60. So I have many, many women who are my patients who are over age 60 who experience this nuisance diarrhea. You know, they'll be going out for a walk, they'll tell me, and they, they just only can walk around their neighborhood because they're so afraid they're gonna have urgency and they're gonna have to come back to the house. Um, they're afraid if they're shopping, especially with the pandemic, you know, the public bathrooms are closed. You know, what are they gonna do if they're going out to the market to get something? It's really, it's, it's really affects someone's quality of life. It's not disabling, you know, you don't lose weight, you don't have bleeding, but it's definitely problematic. And it can be 100% diagnosed and treated. It's diagnosed by colonoscopy and uh, taking biopsies, even if the colon looks normal and um, there's very good treatment for it. Medicines such as mesalamine, sometimes I use steroids, but it's extremely common. I would say if I see patients in a day, I have at least two patients during that day with microscopic colitis, um, which I think is, is pretty, pretty common. So we've talked about autoimmune disease, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and microscopic colitis. We're now gonna move on to the upper GI tract. We talked a little bit about acid reflux, but I wanna talk about another problem that is very common that affects seniors. And that is difficulty swallowing. How do we think about that? How do we think about difficulty swallowing? Are you one person who has difficulty swallowing pills? Is that a problem? Are you on Fosamax because you have bone loss? Well, we know that a lot of these um, agents can cause esophagitis and they have to be taken a particular way. So that's, or are you having problems with other pills and, and what might be causing that? What about having problems when you're eating food? The most common foods that can cause what we call dysphagia or difficulty swallowing is pieces of uh, meat in particular, um, chicken, steak tips, for example, or bread, hard bread in particular gets caught. Apples can also get stuck. Um, that's never normal, by the way. If you're having difficulty with swallowing, you need to see a GI specialist right away. That is, is one of the alarm symptoms. So what causes difficulty swallowing? Well, if you're having difficulty with pills or solid food, then you worry about a structural abnormality in the esophagus. And what I mean by that is an intrinsic narrowing in the esophagus. And that can be a benign cause, such as a web or a ring, a Schatzky ring, um, or a stricture. Now, remember we talked about acid reflux, we talked about those classic symptoms. Well, sometimes people don't have to have classic symptoms, they can have silent reflux, but the damage in the esophagus continues and you can get scar tissue there, what we call a peptic stricture. And then slowly you will have difficulty swallowing pills and then you'll have difficulty eating solid food. So if you're having difficulty with pills, if you're having difficulty swallowing solid food, that is never normal. You should not ignore those symptoms. You should definitely be sure to tell your doctor about it. Now, what if you're having difficulty with liquids? A lot of patients have difficulty with liquids and that usually represents a motility disorder. Um, there's autoimmune disorders such, such as achalasia, for example, where uh, patients have difficulty both with liquids and solids and um, that also needs to be evaluated. Um, and lastly, there's an entity called oropharyngeal dysphagia. So when you're actually initiating your swallow and you're swallowing food, you feel like it's really not going down the right, you know, the right food pipe, if you will. You feel like you're coughing or choking. Um, you might be having TIAs or small little strokes that is impairing your swallowing mechanism. Also not normal. So any of these symptoms, swallowing problems, really need an evaluation.
We talked a little bit about acid reflux. I talked to you just now about getting a peptic stricture. Um, and I said that, you know, you can get scar tissue and damage and that can cause swallowing problems. Well, if you have acid reflux, not only are you at risk for scar tissue and a peptic stricture, but you're at risk for a precancerous condition called Barrett's esophagus. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about that because it's extremely common uh, and it's on the rise, particularly in men in the US, but um, esophageal cancer in the setting of Barrett's is also common in women. 17% of esophageal cancer patients in the United States are women. And actually one of my close friends who passed away uh, was in her 50s and was diagnosed with esophageal cancer in the setting of Barrett's. So I'm particularly mindful as a female gastroenterologist to make sure I'm really talking to my female patients about this because people often think it's a male disease and they forget that women can get this as well. So Barrett's esophagus, it's associated with acid reflux. The longer you have acid reflux, the higher the risk for you to have Barrett's esophagus. As I mentioned, men get it more than women, but women are still at risk for Barrett's and women are also at risk for esophageal cancer. One in every 200 patients with Barrett's esophagus will get esophageal cancer. The esophageal cancer is called adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, which is on the rise in the United States over the last 10 years. You know, back when in the 90s, when I was doing my GI fellowship, we used to see squamous cell cancer of the esophagus, which was in the upper esophagus and that's associated with tobacco and smoking. And now what we're seeing is a rise of a different kind of esophageal cancer called adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. If you have Barrett's, your doctor will tell you, your GI specialist will tell you, you might need an endoscopy every three years. Obviously, within Barrett's, you can get atypical cells, and those atypical cells are dysplastic. It's kind of analogous to an abnormal pap smear. And when you have those abnormal cells, you go from Barrett's to dysplasia, low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and then esophageal cancer. The good news is we have really good radiofrequency ablation and treatment techniques for people with dysplasia. So you don't necessarily have to have surgery, even if you have early esophageal cancer. So that's a huge win over the last couple of years. And I've gotten trained to do that radiofrequency ablation procedure. Moving from pre-malignant conditions in the esophagus, we're gonna talk about pre-malignant conditions in the colon or the large intestine. So this is, Something that I am very proud to do um, every day is to try to decrease the risk of colon cancer. Um, there are very few cancers where you can actually decrease the risk um, of cancer, prevent cancer, because you're picking up a pre-malignant condition. Uh, pap smears do that, and screening colonoscopies do that. Mammograms pick up breast cancer, but they're not picking up a precursor lesion. So this is one of those few very useful um, screening tests. So who needs to go for a screening colonoscopy? Well, the current recommendations just got changed. It's recommended for all individuals over the age of 45. It used to be 50 and now it's 45. Now again, that's a screening exam. That means you don't have a family history of colon cancer or colon polyps and you don't have any of those worrisome symptoms I just went over. You're feeling fine, you're 45. It's recommended that you go for a screening colonoscopy, okay? If you have a family history of colon cancer or colon polyps, then you need to go for a screening exam sooner. Usually it's age 40, but there are genetic cancer syndromes such as Lynch syndrome or HNPCC, and you may need to go for colonoscopy as early as 25, depending on your own genetic cancer syndrome. So that's something that you wanna also keep in mind. Know, know your family history and ask your doctor, when should I go for my screening exam? Here's the number one question I always get asked. Is there a age cutoff? Well, there is no official age cutoff. A patient say, well, I heard I don't have to have one if I'm 75. There's no official age cutoff. What I always tell patients is, look at your, a person's lifespan dictates whether or not they should have a screening test. So if you have a 10 year lifespan and you're in good health and you're pretty spry, then you should go for screening tests. Um, you know, I have some 60 year olds who are in HOMO2, they've had a stroke, they can barely walk, they're not appropriate candidates necessarily for a screening colonoscopy. And then I have 80 year olds who are extremely spry, they're on two medications, you know, they can do everything, um, they'll probably live to be 100. So I think you have to customize and individualize what the right thing to do is. So there is no official age cutoff. How good is stool card testing? It's not good. 
there's a high false positive rate, there's a high false pet negative rate. Um, if you're taking any aspirin or NSAIDs, it's gonna give you a false positive. Most people don't collect the stool cards appropriately. Um, the Cologar test, you know, the little toilet bowl, it's on the, um, that you see on TV. Um, that Cologar test misses 8% of cancers. They say right on the screen, it's 92% accurate, which means 8% miss rate. If you're the 8% where you could have had a screening colonoscopy and picked up your cancer, but you opted for a Cologar test, well, I don't think that's an acceptable number. Um, I, I, I think that if you are high risk for some reason to have a colonoscopy, you've had abdominal surgeries and you're, you know, you really feel like it's a risky procedure for whatever reason, clinical reason, then it makes sense maybe not to have the colonoscopy. If the Cologar test is positive, probably it's either a false positive or you perhaps have a large polyp. So at least you could justify the risk of the colonoscopy. In the average patient, you know, without a lot of medical conditions, it's a very, very safe procedure. It takes about 20 minutes. You get sedated for the procedure. It's very comfortable. Um, and it's the gold standard. Not only do we identify polyps, but we completely remove them. And it's removing the polyps that prevents the colon cancer. So if you have a history of polyps and you know they're precancerous, they're called adenomatous polyps of the colon, you're going for colonoscopy every three to five years, depending on what your doctor tells you. Certainly, if you have a family history of polyps or colon cancer, you, you should be having a colonoscopy. You should not be doing any other stool test. So that's really important. Your family history is really, really important, dictating uh, the best test for you. So I hope, I know I did a whirlwind <laughs> review of many common conditions um, that affect the GI tract, you know, and we reviewed heartburn, ulcer disease, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, pre-malignant conditions such as uh, Barrett's and um, colon cancer screening. So I hope that this has been informative for you. Um, I practice in Chelmsford um, and um, I'm a resident of Carlisle and I'd love to be a resource to the community. So thank you all very much for joining me this afternoon and I'll pause for questions. Jen? Yes, thank you. That was awesome. We have a number of questions in our chat and we'll start with Jane's. She said, my father took Tagamet and had mental problems as a result. Is Tagamet still recommended for the elderly? And she said, as a follow-up, his mental problems went away as soon as he was taken off of Tagamet. Um, you know, I have not seen any specific information on Tagamet causing those problems, but of course, any medication can have any side effect. For example, there are different medications that could cause dizziness or confusion, so it needs to be individualized. On a, on a generalized you know, level, I have not seen Tagamet cause confusion or contribute to dementia, but again, any medication can have any specific side effect in, in any given patient. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. We have another question from Abba Sinkel. Can you please repeat the medicines one should take for occasional heartburn? Lamotidine or Pepcid, P-E-P-C-I-D. Thank you. There's a note about recordings to share with family and we'll have that for um, everyone. And Jane has a question, has Tagamet changed its recipe since the 1980s? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, there's a question from Nancy. Can you enlarge the picture and point out the potato chip edges again that you showed on one of your slides? Yeah, I can. Uh, I don't know that I can enlarge it, but uh, let me show you right here. Can you see my arrow? So this is the ridging right here. You can see sort of a little ridge right here. And yeah. Right here, you can see a little ridging. It's called scalloping. And here you can almost see sort of a wave-like scalloped appearance of the duodenum. So the one where your arrow is now is just an enlargement of- They're different pictures. They're different pictures of the duodenum. And none are normal. It's, a, it's different segments of the duodenum. This is not necessarily enlargement of this. It's just the, you know, the endoscopist took different pictures of highlighting what he or she felt was sort of the classic celiac appearance. 
Thank okay. you. Um, we have another question. Um, let's see. Um, what were the four slides illustrating on slide number eight? You mean these pictures right here? I think so. Uh, cil celiac disease. There were endoscopic pictures of celiac disease. Thank you. Um, Deb had a question. What about difficulty with swallowing associated with spices? Uh, well, spicy foods can cause acid reflux. So if you're having a lot of spicy foods, it can trigger acid reflux and that can cause esophageal spasm. So some people can have um, spasm of the esophagus and maybe some occasional swallowing problems. But again, difficulty swallowing is never normal. So it really, you need to talk to a healthcare professional to tease out those subtleties. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. We have another question from Judy. What are the reasons a person might have a second screening colonoscopy two to three weeks after the first testing? If the prep was bad. So if the doctor could not see very well, um, or they couldn't get to the end of the colon, which is the cecum, where they can see the inside of the appendix. So sometimes, you know, patients do their best to prep for the procedure, but, um, you know, you really can't see. So I, I don't usually bring people back two to three weeks later. I, I, I give them a break because it's really hard to drink that liquid for the, for the prep, for the colonoscopy. But uh, you would probably require a repeat exam because it was an inadequate prep or it, you couldn't visualize the entire large intestine or colon. Okay. Thank you. Another question, a person said, I had a bad reaction to anesthesia for colonoscopy. What can I do different the next time? Well, it depends on the reaction. So, you know, I'm old enough that uh, I used to use Demerol and Versed uh, for a sedation. And Demerol has a, it's a very good medication, but it has a, a long half-life. And so people can have nausea or difficulty after the procedure. We've shifted over to our anesthesia colleagues working with us. And so people get propofol sedation, which is highly lipophilic. So it gets into the butt, you know, gets you sleeping right away. And you also wake up very quickly. You don't have those balance issues, very little nausea. Um, and so actually, especially for my senior patients, I think it's a, it's a great, great option, very safe. Um, so uh, it, I think you have to, I don't know what the individual reaction was, but talk to your doctor about it. And then usually I try and make things work. I have, a, I have quite a few patients who want to come unsedated. So they say, you know what, I can handle this. I just remember this one nurse, she got a local for a hip replacement and I knew she was a tough cookie and she had her colonoscopy completely unsedated and she did great. So that's always an option. Thank you. Um, another person asked, will there ever be better prep for a colonoscopy? There is. Suprep comes in pills. They just got approved in February. So it's 24 pills. My patients love it. All my patients who've had colonoscopies in March are so thrilled um, by taking those pills. They, they, they feel it's much, much easier than the liquid. And you don't drink the gallon. Go lightly, there's a shortage, national shortage. So no one's drinking the gallon anyway. Thank you. Um, there was a question from Gloria. Can you talk about SIBO and the FODMAP diet? I did. SIBO is the bacterial overgrowth. So you can do a test for that. And the FODMAP diet is, I was alluding to the fermentable oligodisaccharides, which is the FOD uh, and MAP. Um, so, so the FODMAP diet is basically minimizing those foods. Um, if you actually follow the FODMAP diet, you have a very, very limited diet. So, um, a lot of us are shifting away from just giving our patients a printout of a low FODMAP diet. Um, I actually like to use a specific website uh, developed by dietitians at the University of Michigan with Dr. Che, who's an expert in this area. And um, I use that so that patients can figure out what their specific triggers are. Um, otherwise, you're really not eating very much um, if you follow a low FODMAP diet. And it's, it's not a durable solution for, for patients. So I don't believe in just telling people, here, here's a low FODMAP diet, go follow it. Thank you. Um, another participant had a question and said, I've had two bouts of diverticulitis in different parts of the colon and worry about getting that again. Is there some kind of cleanse that makes any difference in the development of this? 
So I didn't talk about diverticular disease. Diverticular disease in the United States is extremely common. Most people who have diverticulosis, which are the little pockets of the colon, they develop these pockets because, you know, unless you have a 100% plant-based diet and you have an animal diet, mainly an animal diet, you'd get weakening in your colon, particularly the left side of your colon, which puts you at risk for diverticulosis. Um, so to once you have diverticular disease, those pockets are never going away. But if you want to decrease your formation of new pockets, I always say you're supposed to be drinking a gallon of water a day. Most people barely get to two liters and you should be having six servings of fruits and vegetables daily. Most people do not have six servings of fruits and vegetables daily. Thank you. We have one more question um, from Claudia. Can you talk about the effect of weight on acid reflux? I also have hiatal hernia and was experiencing very bad reflux on Prilosec twice a day and couldn't go without. I lost about 10 pounds and surprisingly, it really improved reflux. Or what's the one thing that happened after I lost weight so that I'm guessing it had an influence? So body mass index um, is another big risk factor for acid reflux for sure. So I talked about those food triggers, but one of the things I didn't mention, I'm glad you brought it up, is an elevated body mass index. So I always tell patients, you know, if your BMI is 30 or above, if you lose weight, you probably don't need to be on a medication for acid reflux. A hiatal hernia is very common. So most, there are people who can have hiatal hernias that don't have acid reflux, but there are most patients with acid reflux tend to have hiatal hernias. Both of those statements are true. The larger the hernia, what that means is your stomach sort of slides above the diaphragm and uh, because it's sliding up and down, you're not getting a closure of that sphincter muscle I spoke about. So it puts you at risk for reflux. And I would say maybe only two or three times per year do I ever have to talk to my patients about surgery because their hiatal hernia is large. Most of the time with weight loss and appropriate medication, it controls the symptoms. Thank you. We have one more question that just came in from Marge. Is there surgery for that hernia? Yes, as I mentioned, if people have a large hiatal hernia, there is a surgery called a Nissen fundiplication. Um, there are also some patients who um, opt to have surgery for acid reflux. Um, I always caution patients if they want to have surgery for acid reflux that the surgery is really only good for 10 years. I always think about this young man I met many, many years ago who was 34, who had really bad acid reflux at age 20. He thought he had surgery. He had it at Mass General. He thought he was done. He came to me as a patient at age 34 with horrible acid reflux, and he was really, really angry because he couldn't believe he needed to be on medicine the rest of his life and he was only 34 after having a major surgery. So I caution patients, surgery for acid reflux is not a durable solution. And so you have to really choose wisely if you're gonna have surgery for it. It has to be a really good reason. Thank oh. you. I think that's all the questions that we can, had in our we, chat. Oh, I have a question. Can sure. you explain a diurnal hernia? I, I'm not sure I know what a diurnal hernia is. Oh, of, the, of the small intestine. I'm not sure I know what that is. All right. I did hear of it, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, we want to thank Dr. Erkerker today for a wonderful talk. This was fantastic. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thanks for having me, everyone. Have a good afternoon. And thank you all for attending the talk today. Have a great afternoon. You too. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you.